This is Horror Podcast. Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm Michael David Wilson, and every episode alongside my co-host Bob Pastorella, we chat with Masters of Horror about writing, life lessons, creativity, and much more. Now today's guest is Gwendolyn Keist. She is a Pennsylvania-based horror and speculative fiction writer. She writes short stories and novels, and she won the 2018 Bram Stoker Award, and indeed the This Is Horror Novel of the Year Award, for the Rust Maidens. She was born in Ohio, raised in Philadelphia, and now lives outside Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And that is Gwendolyn Keist. Now before we get into today's conversation, a little bit of an advert break. From best-selling author Lee Mountford comes a new supernatural horror series perfect for lovers of demonic haunted houses. Book one, Haunted Perrin Manor, follows two sisters as they move into an old family home only to discover evil already resides there. The series is available in ebook and paperback formats and high-quality audiobooks from producer Hannibal Hills. Search Amazon and Audible for Haunted Perrin Manor now. Don't just read horror, experience it. Spacefaring researchers disturb an ancient horror. An enchanted object curses a grieving widow. A haunted reel torments a film student. A murder trial hinges on a chilling testimony. Howls from Hell. A new horror anthology from Hal Society Press. Stephen Graham Jones calls it quality horror by true believers who can write. With a forward by Grady Hendrix, Howls from Hell unveils the horror writers of tomorrow with spine-tingling stories from P.L. McMillan, Shane Hawk, J.W. Donnelly, Lindsay Ragsdale, Amanda Nevada DeMille, and others. Available now in paperback, ebook, and audiobook from Amazon and most other major booksellers. Howls from Hell. Okay, well, with that said... Here it is, it is Gwendolyn Keist on This Is Horror. Gwendolyn, welcome back to This Is Horror. Thank you so much for having me. I am so, so excited to be back. Yeah, it's been a couple of years now since we last spoke with you, so, I mean, I'm wondering what the biggest changes have been for you personally and professionally and I'm aware as I asked that that probably one of them is like well there's a pandemic going on at the moment that's quite a, a big change <laughs> yeah yeah that's yeah that's definitely a really big personal change I was reading this like essay recently talking about how it's very rare that artists will all be going through something at exactly the same moment that usually it's a little more like each person kind of goes through different things but right now it's like we're all going through the same thing like pretty much around the world no matter where you're at this is something we all really are sharing so it's definitely something that I yeah it's, it's affecting all of us for sure so that's that's definitely probably the biggest personal thing I can think of right right off right off top of my head. So professionally, you know, I think when I was on the show last, we were talking about the Rust Maidens. It had just come out, I believe, at the time when we were talking last. So yeah, so that that came out and and it won the This Is Horror Award, which was like so exciting. That's that's like very much a, a career highlight. So I need to put that put that out there right now. Yeah, <laughs> so that, that was yeah. great and it won the stoker and yeah it had another novel come out another novella and i've got another novel in the works so a lot of stuff going on it's been a very busy couple of years it's been a very busy 
productive couple of years, fortunately. Even the last year, I've kept fairly busy because I'm, I've got a lot of nervous energy. So it's like, okay, if I'm going to be stuck in the house, I got to do something. So I've at least gotten some writing done, but a lot of worrying done too. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, so what has this last year looked like for you? What have been some of the changes as a result of the pandemic, both good and bad? Because, I mean, I know you're a full-time writer and have been yeah. working from home, so mm -hmm. I, I guess in that respect it could be business as usual, but, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's yeah. an interesting one. Well, you know, it, it's kind of funny because now my husband works from home as well. And it was always, he works in communications. And so we always figured even if something huge would happen, he would still have to go into the office, but he's been able to work from home as well. And the irony is I used to always tell him like, I can't work when you're in the room. You can't be in the room when I'm working. And now of course it turns out that, you know, when push comes to shove, I can totally work when he's in the room. So yeah, like, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, because we share an office now and it's it's honestly fine. Like I was just like kind of surly when I used to be like, no, I can't write with you in the room. And it's like I literally wrote a whole novel with him in the room. So clearly I was able to do that. Yeah. <laughs> so that was a big change, I guess. Like that's kind of one of those things that he's like, yeah. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> surly writers. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we like to have our kind of optimal writing conditions and kind of set yeah. the room up and set even the drink up that we have, the music just exactly mm -hmm. right. But mm -hmm. we will find that if our life or our environment shifts, we will <laughs> adapt. You know, it might not be optimal. Yep. It might not be exactly how we'd like to do it, but... Gosh darn it, we will work <laughs> with whatever <laughs> conditions there are. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So that that turned out to be fine. And it's actually been nice to like, I can even like run like I, I've got some idea. I want to bounce off somebody who's like literally sitting over there at his desk. And I'm like, hey, what do you think about this idea? So, you know, it's actually very nice to be able to work together. So that's been a very big positive over the last year. Yeah, does he equally do the same with you? It's like, right, we've got an interesting communication difficulty. I know you're working on a story at the moment. But. <laughs> Not exactly the same type of job. So no, I don't, I don't get all the insight into what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, talking about yeah, your second novel, so Bone Set and Feathers, it only recently came out. So what can you tell us about it? Well, it's all about witches. It's it's like I'm calling it my witch novel. I always wanted to write a, a book about witches and this is this is my witch book. So it's kind of like a fairy tale. It's it's more like, you know, kind of more olden times and it's about the last witch left in her village after witch hunts came through and they she's trying to hide out from the witch finders who are on their way back to the village. And so it it like I said, it's it's got very much like a fairy tale feel. Kind of also it's been described as being very folk horror. You know, it's about a lot of female friendship and, and female characters and female empowerment. That's that's a big thing that I think people always point out kind of runs across all of my work and yeah it's sort of like my response to the fact that a lot of stories about witches you know over the years have still had kind of a male perspective on them or still made the witches always be evil so I wanted to really kind of take that and, and really tell stories of witch hunts more from the the witches perspective yeah and what do you think of some of the misconceptions about witches yeah, that they're all evil. Not that I'm saying that there aren't maybe evil witches out there. I don't know. I don't know what other people's definitions of evil even is. But uh, yeah, like just that witches come in all different forms and have all, you know, different backgrounds and, and witchcraft has been practiced around the world for years. I was just talking in an interview recently about how folk magic is something that really exists in every culture and you know and it's different for every culture but you know this kind of magic that that's really practiced you know in a specific area and it has its own kind of history and really looking also at the history of witchcraft and the history of women being you know 
oppressed and held back and how much those two things have have very much overlapped in in witch hunts you know historically and kind of exploring that in 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 the book a little bit now i wonder how much did you research and read other witchy fiction and watch other witchy films and how many things were already kind of part of your life and so things that you didn't need to look up so much I mean <laughs> you know we, we've spoken before about being a, a teenage goth and ar <laughs> arguably an adult goth depending on <laughs> how one <laughs> defines goth and you know I know growing up with that as well witchcraft and witchy stuff does tend to form part of that yeah, definitely. And it was a lot of it was were things that I'd, I'd already researched and already knew. Like I said, you know, I already loved folk magic and just looking at the history of witchcraft. A lot of these were things that, that I knew a lot about. I, I remember when I was like, how old was I? Maybe nine or 10. And I had we all had to pick some topic for this like long, like almost like a semester long uh, you know, big project, you'd have to present it at the end. And I, I picked the Salem witch trials and like made a diorama, which is probably in poor taste looking back. Like you don't make a diorama of a witch hunt, but I was like 10 and, you know, I was like, this really happened. And I wanted everybody to know about it and everything. So it's like I started researching a lot of this stuff at a very, very young age. So a lot of it I already knew and, and, you know, had never really written very much about it. And hopefully I dealt with this, you know, more, uh, more tastefully than probably the the witch diorama <laughs> the witch hunt diorama i did it even had barbie dolls in it and stuff <laughs> like it was it was probably really grotesque now that i'm thinking back there's probably a picture of it somewhere oh my <laughs> oh my well it's so formative it's all part of that witchy education and getting you into <laughs> that headspace so no kind of piece of writing is really wasted. It was just written a long time before, ready for bone set and feathers. Yeah. yeah, I think I always, you know, when whenever I talk to other writers, and it is interesting how so many of us, when we finally get to writing a project, it, it's been something that's been part of us in one way or another for years, if, if not decades. It's such an interesting part of the creative process of how much you kind of carry things with you for years and years before they might actually kind of come out in some sort of written form. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so I wonder how much do you think in the modern world there are parallels with kind of people being cast as witches and then witch finders kind of coming to get them and I'm aware as I ask this question that this this could take the conversation <laughs> in in a very interesting direction and we could talk at length maybe I only needed to ask that and now we've got the episode you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah I would definitely so over the last few years that's very much been at least at least the direction here here in America that's very much kind of politically the, the way it's gone and I, I think that's why like last year whenever my book came out that was coming out like there were so many books about witches that came out last year I think because so many of us are feeling this way are feeling the very much the the politics of of the previous four years very much and continuing now I mean it's you know I, I'm I'm trying to be at least a little bit optimistic with the fact that at least we didn't get four more years of of Donald Trump but you know it's still it's still scary and it's scary the direction things have gone and could continue to go. So uh, it's very scary. Like you said, now it's taking a, now it's taking a, a sad turn already, a dour turn because <laughs> it's been scary. It's definitely been a scary few years. Yeah. What are you most scared about now? I know that that's a fucking <laughs> lovely lighthearted question to throw in <laughs> 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as soon as we start talking about this, the so witch hunts and everything, it's, it, it gets it gets uh, sour quickly. Yeah. What am I most afraid of right now? Just things falling apart even more. You know, I I always I I tend to be pretty optimistic. I mean, I've I've certainly got a cynical side, but I try to kind of think, okay, if you think optimistically, you can kind of hopefully think of ways to to make the world at least a little bit better. And that's what I'm always like 
trying to think of, but I think my fear is that things won't get better and they'll only get worse. That That's my biggest fear because I feel like we are at a crossroads right now and we have so many opportunities to make things better and to kind of take this moment. And we're, we're really at a place where we're recognizing a lot of the areas where we really need to work on things as a society and, and as you know a global community. And I, I feel like we could go in a really positive direction, but when you're at a crossroads, you could obviously just as easily go in, in a worse direction. So I think that's where I'm at, that we won't kind of take the turn towards making things better. And I do think, I feel like this this last few years, and even, you know, especially during the pandemic and everything that's gone on, I feel like this will be a time that people will look back on and whether we get this right or we don't, I think people will say that's a moment in time when we but we either got things right or we really got things very wrong. So it's kind of like people always say, you know, history's, you know, got its eye on us or whatever. But I think that's very true right now. So I'm just hoping that things will get better and not get worse. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I guess so many of us, we have this kind of inner battle in the sense that we want to frame things optimistically. That's Mm -hmm. the way Mm -hmm. that we want our mind Mm -hmm. to work. But then there's also Mm -hmm. this other part of our mind that might say things like, yeah, but it's going to get worse. And you're like, (laughs) shut up that part of my mind. (laughs) So how how do you kind of navigate that and how do you ensure that for the majority of the time you know the optimistic side is winning out oh that's a great question i actually wish i had an answer because i feel like sometimes it like so doesn't win out and i just get so cynical about things and and you know one of the things i think helps is as much as i think social media can be very toxic at times Sometimes just seeing, you know, people that that I care about and and other authors, you know, doing well and seeing their successes and seeing their joys and the things that are happening that are good for them. And and that may be writing related. It may be personal. You know, I've known a number of people, three people I can think of off the top of my head who've had babies in, in the last year during the pandemic. And it's like, to me, that's like, I don't even want kids. I have no desire to have kids, but babies are just like such a positive thing overall. I think it's like all this hope and all this, you know, the, this or this new life. And so I think about that and I think about how many how many positive things have happened for people and, and I try to focus on that and think that, you know, I can't get I can't get too cynical. I'm I'm very close to one of my cousins. You know, we grew up together. It was we were fairly close in age and she's got a little girl who's really into literature and really into spooky things. And like sometimes I'll be in such a cynical mood and then I'll see something that, that the little girl's like like a crack she's put together or she's made herself a felt hat or just something like little, like something like not this gigantic like thing, you know. But it, it it's really nice, and it just reminds me, like, okay, these are the things we're, we're, we're we keep going for. Sometimes it's just the the, the little arts and crafts that some a little kid does that can keep you going and be like, okay, it's worth it's worth it. Keep fighting, keep trying to be optimistic. So, yeah, sometimes the cynicism wins out, though. <laughs> right, and I mean, so I've got a two year old daughter, and it's so interesting yeah. how zen in a sense they are like they are so Mm -hmm. in the present moment it's like if they're in a moment Mm -hmm. of joy then they are experiencing that unfortunately the other way works as well if they're angry (laughs) if they're upset then they are very much in that present moment too but i do think there is something to be learned from looking at these moments of joy and looking Mm -hmm. at even even if the rest of your world is falling apart just Mm -hmm. enjoying the positive moments and concentrating on that and i mean this is something that i'm thinking about a lot at the moment because i i don't know if i've said to you or if you've seen but i did relatively recently the last few months uh, and end a 12-year relationship so that's been a huge change for me but and 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 days uh up and days are down and Mm -hmm. (laughs) often the same day this is this is an emotional roller coaster but it's Mm -hmm. it's trying to tap into when something is positive and when you're you're having fun like this conversation because apparently i enjoy asking you things like what's the thing that scares (laughs) you the most and so we're all kind of fucked how do you (laughs) 
act optimistically, <laughs> but you know, I seek joy and I concentrate on things like that. And here I am still standing. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's like mm -hmm. the way through, at least that's the only way I've ever found through it. Yeah. 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 It's, it's seeing a lot of stuff on social media, you know, and I, I get exactly what you're talking about because any time that I see that somebody else has done something great, it's, especially with writing or something like that, man, that pumps me up. I don't think, mm -hmm. you know, there's been a lot of talk lately on social media about how some people think that like this is like some kind of competition and, and it's really not. And mm -hmm. it, it's to me that's that's inspiration when somebody gets you know i've seen a couple of people recently um who have, who have signed you know contracts and things like that mm -hmm. and that's just it's so i don't know it, it to me i just find that so inspirational it lifts me up you know and then you have days where there's nothing good on social media and everything is bad and that's when i'll just turn off the computer and i'm gonna lay on my bed and read calvin and Hobbes. so and, and you know yeah. That's, that's how I, I have to cope with shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's, that's a very good, very good way of, of doing it. Like, and that's kind of what I've been trying to do over the last couple of months, because when social media gets bad, it gets so toxic and it's just like, it's like emotional poison. So I've been like, you know, mm -hmm. I can back away from it. You know, I'm not, none of us are obligated to be there at all. I mean, nobody's obligated to be on social media. It's not really like, you know, you have to. So it's like, if you need to take a day off, a week off, a month off, that's that's your prerogative. You're able to do that. And I just remind myself, you know, if I only check once or twice a day what's going on, yes, I might miss some things. And yeah, that's that, especially like you said, if it's something positive. I don't want to not celebrate with somebody if, you know, if it's somebody that I that I talk to a lot and, you know, I do want to be there. But here's the thing. If it's something positive, it'll probably come back up through the through the feed again at some point anyway. So I'll, I'll find out about it eventually. And so, yeah, when it's negative on there, it can be a lot. And ugh. so, yeah, just kind of stepping back when when I need to has definitely helped. Like you said, like, just be like, I'm just going to stay away today and go do something positive for myself. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I'm talking about things that are positive and in a way I'm surprised that you didn't bring this up when I asked you about changes, but you've got a two book deal with Saga <laughs> Press. <laughs> I feel like everybody's tired of hearing about it already because I feel like I talk about it constantly, but yeah. Hey, if you haven't <laughs> spoken about it on This Is Horror, then you haven't <laughs> spoken about it enough just yet. So this is your yeah, moment. That's true. <laughs> mm -hmm. I like the way you think. Yes. Yes, we announced that I think last August, two book deal with Saga Press, and I've loved Saga's books forever. Like they've had some of the coolest books that have come out over the last few years. The Only Good Indians was the big one from last year. That's just such a great, great book, and so I am so excited to have two books that will be coming out through through Saga Press in the next couple of years. So yeah, my, the first one is Reluctant Immortals. It should be out sometime next year. So. Yeah, that's that's a really big one, really big. <laughs> and how did this deal come about? You know, I just uh, the editor Joe read the Rust Maidens and reached out to me, and and I pitched the book that I was working on, and yeah, it was was really really pretty straightforward and very very exciting sort of like this kind of dream come true type of situation that like sometimes you'll just like sit and make up scenarios like yeah wouldn't it be great if like one of my like one of my very favorite presses would just reach out to me and say hey i really like your work which is kind of exactly what happened so yeah yeah that's very very exciting i mean i think there's something wonderful about that that shows if you put in the hard work and if you kind of give out these positive vibes, which of course you've been doing. I mean, you're always like looking after other writers in terms of letting people know about calls for submissions and interviews and really championing other people within the genre. And it, I, I like to believe that this shows that the universe kind of returns. It <laughs> looks after you and this is what's, happened uh, in the form of Joe Monty reaching out with a contract. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like that. And thank you. I'm, I'm always glad to hear that 
that you know the, the stuff I'm doing is helpful to people. That's always very nice to hear. It's like I said, sometimes the social media can almost feel like screaming into a void. So it's always nice to know, like whenever somebody's like, "Oh, yay, I submitted to something because of your submission roundup," I'm like, "Yay!" Because I remember at one point, this was years ago, I had been doing the submission roundup for maybe a year, and I was like, I said to my husband, "I'm like, I don't know, I don't know if anybody's even reading it." And I had started thinking about not doing it anymore because I'm like, if nobody's reading it, I'm not gonna like waste people's space on the feed. And it happened like that very week like two or three people actually contacted me it was like oh my gosh I love your submission roundup so much I just got a, an acceptance because I found something through that post and it was it was like you said like the universe speaking I was like oh well I guess this is the way of knowing that it actually is helping so that was like okay I'll keep doing it and since then like people do periodically say oh it really helps me you know find places so that's always good to know but it is just ironic that there was one point that I was yeah. ready to stop doing it because I was like, I don't know. I don't know if anybody even cares if I'm just that person who's put together this poster and just like, why is she even doing that? So that's nice to know that it's it's a positive thing. Yeah, well, I think with all forms of art and writing, there are always many more people silently consuming than there are being vocal about it. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I guess mm -hmm. the takeaway for people here is if there's something you're reading or you're listening to and you know it's really adding value to your life then let the people know um be because they they might not be aware just how much you know it 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 is enhancing things and i mean there'll be i imagine a number of posts that you put up no comments, no <laughs> likes as such, but you've probably got a load of readers that are just really taken away from it. So on that basis, we uh, we look forward to your tweets. So it's at This Is Horror and at Gwendolyn Geist, and you can let us know <laughs> just how much value we're adding to your life. <laughs> I do think it's true, though, that that sometimes, like, just in general, we don't think, and, you know, I don't think a lot of us think about saying something, if something's positive, we just kind of go about, like, oh, that's really nice. We might even say it aloud to ourselves yeah. or think it, yeah. but we don't we <laughs> end up saying it. You know, I do feel like we tend to speak more about things that upset us, which that's obviously fine, too. But I, I do like to try to, you know, like, a lot of times I feel like I'm that person that's like, yay, about something, and then I'm like, oh hope I'm not too much of that but at the same time I'm like yeah you know I always appreciate it so it's like you, you know you want to go and do the things that if, if that that if you would appreciate it then go do it for somebody else so yeah yeah, yeah. trying yeah. to make social media a little bit more positive <laughs> mm, definitely well mm -hmm. is there much that you can tell us about the reluctant immortals yeah, yeah, I can I can give you I can give you the the basic rundown. So it's actually uh based on two short stories that I wrote. It's uh from the sh short story I had from Nightmare Magazine called The Eight People Who Murdered Me, excerpt from Lucy West Enra's diary, which actually won a Bram Stoker Award last year. And then also a story I wrote that appeared in a Flame Tree anthology uh called The Woman Out of the Attic. So the book is about Lucy West Enra from Dracula and Bertha Antoinette Mason, the so-called mad woman in the attic from Jane Eyre. And so it just, it follows, the story follows them as they're uh, dealing with Dracula and Edward Rochester. And it takes place in the, in 1967, California during the summer of love. So it's like all, all these different things that I, I love. I love Gothic literature. I love retellings. And then I love the 1960s. So I'm like, I'm going to put these all together. And I'm going to gonna see see uh, what I come up with with this. Yeah. And th this is how originality occurs. You just kind of put all the things that you like into <laughs> this mixing <True>. part. <laughs> and you're like, right, well, this is the story that I'm going to write, and that's such a delicious combination of, <laughs> of flavors that we've got going on. Um, mm. I can't wait to read it, because I, I like all of those things, um, and I'm super intrigued to see, okay, what does that look like, especially mm -hmm. throwing the gothic with the summer of love. Yeah, bring it on. <laughs> Shit, I've you got know, my... I... Oh, <laughs> I know you have. You always do. 
Yeah, and I love Gothic California. You know, I like the idea of Gothic California anyways, because I think we tend to associate California with just being so sunny all the time. And I'm always like, oh, those are the type of places I'm like, let's find what's Gothic there. And, you know, I was thinking a lot about, about Sunset Boulevard, which to me is like the ultimate Gothic Californian story. And I, I love that movie. I remember seeing that movie when I was younger. And so I was definitely thinking about that and thinking about other, you know, uh, films and stories that kind of look at, you know, these kind of, yeah, just, just the gothic settings and places you, you don't expect them. Because I, I love gothic horror so much. And I always feel like there's certain things that people are like, oh, it's been done to death. I'm like, yeah, but it's good. So it's okay to keep keep doing different things with it. Because I just, I love the gothic so much. As we were saying, like we were, you know, so many of us were goths when we were younger. Yeah. We all love the, love, we love gothic stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So is the reluctant immortals complete is it now with the editor or at what what yeah. stage yeah yes it is it is complete it is with the editor it will be coming back to me sometime soon we'll be editing it so i'm very very excited to move on to that stage i i, I actually told my husband like what always ends up happening is when I'm working on a project, I'm like, oh, I just can't wait for it to be done. And as soon as it's done, like this one especially, I'm like, now I miss it. It feels yeah. like it's left home. Like, I, I can't wait till it comes back to me. And then, like, I make the joke of, like, then when it comes back, I'll be like, go out and get a job. <laughs> <laughs> get out the door again. But right now, I'm like, I can't wait to, to get it back and start working on it and making it even better. Like, I'm very excited about that. Yeah. So does that mean that now you're working on the second book in the two book deal that's gonna be yeah that's gonna be then the next thing i'm actually i'm i've taken a break from long fiction i'm working on some short fiction right now it's like a in between because i love short fiction i always talk about how much i love short stories love reading them that was my first introduction to horror was reading short short stories like and and poe i should say there's also poe short stories and poe's poetry but i've always loved horror short stories so i'm like excited i'm writing a couple of short stories right now then i'll be on to the to the next book so yeah yeah and i wonder when you complete a book and you send it to the editor i mean what what kind of happens next in terms of your working process do you give yourself some time off it's like i completed a goddamn book i'm gonna take a week <laughs> off this is gwendolyn's wild holiday or what you know what happens next <laughs> You know, usually I want to just keep working, but I find that I'm just kind of like blood dry. There's not like much energy left. Like I'm only just now, like I, I turned the book in about a month ago and I'm still like, okay, I'm just now starting to like get some momentum back with writing. I feel like sometimes it, it takes a while. This time though, I did actually take a week off because my husband had some days left over from last year from like vacation days, they let him carry him over for a few months. And so he had extra because we didn't go anywhere or do literally anything last year. So he had like vacation days and like that never happens. We usually end up using them because we, we live pretty far from where he works. Mostly he has to take a lot of days for like snow and stuff. Like it's like we usually at the end of the year are like budgeting the days being like, oh my God, if there's a snowstorm, you'll have to drive in because you have no vacation days. And like this year it was like, oh, we have a few extras. So he took a week off and we just like hung out. But then we were like bored because we didn't have anything to do. <laughs> I was like, we should have planned more like activities around the house. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I mean, when you're working so hard, it can be difficult to to plan what you're doing for your downtime at the best of times. Yeah. But when your limitations yeah. are kind of like, and by the way, all these activities occur in this house. I mean, it kind of <laughs> sounds like a game show, which is uh taking us back to our off-air omelette competition so there's an obscure reference that no one will get i suppose i've now got to put it in the outtakes <laughs> yes secret omelette competitions <laughs> yeah <laughs> well that is i mean that is how you're entertaining yourself you know you said you've got a house you've got to think of some activities <laughs> during your yeah. downtime so <laughs> one-on-one -on -one <laughs> omelet off <laughs> there we go there we go yeah it's been it's been interesting because i'm i'm never really considered myself much of a homebody I've, I've always been like let's go out and do something even if it's just like going to a local museum or taking a drive or walking somewhere which we you know you can still walk places i guess but it's like 
yeah, I'm just so used to being like, let's get out of the house. Let's go do something. And now I'm like, oh, it's our day off. We're just going to be staying at the house. So we've actually been building puzzles. It's kind of like, I never would have imagined myself to be somebody who builds puzzles, but it's actually been very meditative. Like we've been building puzzles and like uh, my friend oh, writer, Krista Carmen actually sent me a Dracula puzzle. And what I thought was so funny is I waited to finish it till after I was done with my Dracula novel. So that was something I did on my downtime on the week off was like, Oh, I'm done with my novel. That's based in part on Dracula. And I'm going to do a Dracula puzzle because I can't get away from it too far. But yeah, so she had sent me a puzzle, I think for, for my birthday. And I was like, okay, and so now my husband and I've been doing puzzles so that's like a it's so wholesome like I never would have imagined like oh I'm I'm in my late 30s and now I sit in my house all day doing puzzles but it's, <laughs> it's not that bad it's nice it's actually a nice way of spending the time <laughs> yeah I mean sometimes like I just kind of dream about what would my teenage self say if they saw certain snapshots of what I'm doing right now like would they be appalled would they be like you know I, I could imagine particularly a rebellious goth type you're doing a puzzle and they're like you fucking sell out <laughs> you joined the man what are you doing <laughs> Yes, but at least I was doing a Dracula puzzle. So yeah. That way it's like, okay, you get a little bit of, you get to keep a little bit of your street cred. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe they'd assume, okay, it's not just a puzzle. This is some occult ritual when you put the, the final piece in. That's it. Dracula will be summoned or something like that. <laughs> yes. Occult exactly. experiment gone wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> or gone right, depending on how you want it to be. Right, out. exactly. <laughs> yeah. I was like, everything's all screwed up. Nope, it's not. It's really not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, tying into your forthcoming novel, Ryan Whitley says, I love the story, The Eight People Who Murdered Me. Can you tell us a little bit about how the idea for it came to you? You know, I've always loved Lucy. I've always loved the character of Lucy. And I remember growing up, I hadn't read Dracula yet. I was like five or six. And my my parents uh, got a copy that was like this annotated copy that they had to order from, like I think, England. And back then, it was not actually as easy to order things from overseas as I feel like it is now. Like they had to go to, you know, a rare bookseller, had to then order it and, you know, get it in and everything. And so I remember when it came and it was like this really big, exciting, like moment in uh in the house and and I asked about Dracula and you know I'd seen the uh, Bella Lugosi version I think at that point but it isn't exactly that close to I mean it is and it isn't there's a lot of uh, variation from the original story so my parents are telling me about it I would always ask about the female characters like who are the female characters in, in the book and uh, my parents were like oh there's Mina and Lucy and I'm like you know tell me about them and it's like well Lucy dies and Mina lives is basically like the the description of of what happens and I was like oh and I was always sad for Lucy that she she died and I remember seeing uh Bram Stoker's Dracula at a very young age it's probably like nine when I saw it which is probably a little too young but eh, I saw a lot of horror movies when I was really young <laughs> and I loved Sadie Frost's depiction of Lucy and I just remember being like I want like a whole movie just about her I like her better than anybody else and it just kind of stayed with me and then a few years ago I was thinking you know I love to do retellings I love to read retellings and I was like, you know, I don't think I've ever seen anything from Lucy's perspective. And I remember I actually spent a few months before I would even I even started writing, thinking there's got to be something out there that's that's done this already. And I couldn't ever find anything. I mean, I searched for months, and I even asked around to friends. I'm like, have you guys ever seen anything done from from Lucy's perspective? And everybody's like, no, I'm, I'm, I've never seen anything like that. So I'm like, all right, then I'll write it. And so yeah, that's that's like how it how it came about. And it took me a couple years to actually finish the short story. I think I wrote the Rust Maidens in the amount of time that it actually took me just to finish the short story because I couldn't figure out how to get like the form of it. And then I settled on this kind of like journal entries from her perspective, which I thought like worked well, like dovetailing with the original book, which is all like epistolary and letters and everything. So yeah, it was really just that I loved Lucy so much. And I was like, I want to I want to hang out with Lucy. I want to hang out with a fictional version of Lucy. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny as well how some stories will just be able to write very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And others, mm -hmm. like it can take so much time to get all the pieces 
into place and then the the actual word count and the form of the story doesn't necessarily relate to the -hmm. amount of time it took to compose so I mean I guess a misconception (laughs) would be well obviously the novel or novella took longer than the short story but sometimes I mean because of the limitations of the short story it can be that that one it, it, it is the one that's taking longer. I, I can't remember who said it. I don't know if it was Mark Twain, but there's there's a quote about, you know, sorry, I wrote a long letter. I didn't have time to write a shorter one. And that's often <laughs> the way it goes. I like that. Yes. Yes, it is. It's so true. And now that I'm thinking about it, it actually took me less time to write the novel Reluctant Immortals, it's got Lucy in it, than it took to write the short story about her. So that's actually really kind of ironic. <laughs> so yeah, it is It is very strange how, how writing can work like that. I think the fact that the short story took so long, though, made it so I wasn't ready to let Lucy go after the end of it. I was like, I want to hang out with this character more. I've already been hanging out with her for two years, so I might as well hang out with her some more. So I think that's part of the reason why I was like, yeah, I could expand this into a longer story. So have what would that look like so that's kind of how how the seed for the book even came about yeah yeah and for quote fans for twain a maniacs it is indeed mark twain who said it he said i didn't have time to write you a short letter so i wrote you a long one instead (laughs) (laughs) that's great boy he sure had a lot of quotes I know. Yeah. To to be honest, I don't like. Am I just saying Mark Twain? Because eighty percent of the time I quote something, it's Mark Twain. But no, he's struck again. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't think he like sat around thinking <laughs> what quotables can I write. But I will say, on the basis of the things that he did write that were quotable. If Mark Twain was in this environment with a Twitter account, he would absolutely be thriving, you know. He, oh, yeah. he, he could nail the the 140 character thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's always I always love seeing when people are like, you know, what what writers would be really good on Twitter and what writers would not probably be as good on Twitter. And yeah, I think Mark Twain would have been pretty good on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> would have been That's a format he could have he could have really done well. Oh, yeah. yeah. No doubt. Yeah, I think Hemingway could have, you know, done fairly well on Twitter, but I guess it would depend if he drunk tweeted as well. If he drunk <laughs> tweeted, maybe he'd get banned. But <laughs> yeah, he he had some some short quotes, and mm-hmm. I mean, one yeah. of which his writing advice being to just start by writing the truest sentence you know. So mm-hmm. on that basis. What do you think is the truest thing that you know? Wow. <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, didn't expect that segue from no, a Twitter, no, <laughs> from a, a Twitter from comment. Like, <laughs> yeah, this is something really deep. Yeah. And maybe that's part of it. What I just said is I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I, I think that as I've gotten older, the more I've the more I've realized that, you know, it's that like you get older and, and the more you know, the less you realize, you know, and I feel like that that's kind of where I where I'm at. Like, I was so sure of things when I was younger. And now that I'm older, I'm like, life's a lot more complicated than than I think I recognized when when I was younger. And so maybe that's the truest thing that I know. Life is complicated and messy. <laughs> So much messier than I expected. I always thought things would be like very neat and orderly, like a narrative, like a story. And it's often not like that. Yeah. At what point do you think you realize that life is in fact messy? You know, I I feel like I had at least a little bit of an inkling of it, but I was always like, no, 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 I'm wrong. It's 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 more it's more straightforward than that. But definitely Definitely over the last five years or so, that's very much come into into sharper relief for me, I think. And especially with the online environment that, that doesn't always allow for as much nuance as I think we, we would benefit from and that we benefit from in like more real life conversations and things. I, I think that that's where I'm like, you know, 
sometimes it feels like we want things to be really neat and orderly and really straightforward and and it's not and it's it's it can be messier than what we can even communicate through you know twitter or facebook that, that we need also the the interaction with each other you know the eye contact the body language you know even hearing people's tone of voice to understand because i've even seen people get into fights online and then like somebody will explain no i didn't mean it that way and you can see how it was just misinterpreted and it really wasn't that anybody was doing anything mean to each other it was just something was misinterpreted and and that can still happen and so just you know things are messier than i ever want them to be that's for sure yeah i think because things can get lost in kind of text communication that's why there's been the rise in the emoji <laughs> as of late right. because, <laughs> because like you know you, you can't tell without having that tone and the the way that something is delivered it's like okay what mm -hmm. did they actually say and and so for many years i I resisted the emoji because I don't know my words will speak for themselves. But it's like, yeah, but Michael, you also have very blunt and strong opinions. So a lot of people think you're being an asshole. So you might want to throw an emoji in. I mean, you can't obviously insult someone and then do a bit of a wink. That you do have to temper what you're saying too. But I, I do think when there's ambiguity i'm beginning to see the case for the emoji so is that something you yeah. throw in with your own personal communications or have you resisted the emoji thus far <laughs> you know what's funny is i i did resist emojis for the longest time and then i found the same thing you did like i would like write something and i'd get ready to like post it and then i'd look at it I'm like man this could be taken wrong i can see how it could very easily be taken as maybe i'm being sarcastic <laughs> it wouldn't be i would be being very like <laughs> And, and earnest about it and I'm like but I could see how somebody could think this is sarcastic so it's like add a smiley face add a laughing face add a heart add something that like indicates like no this is gonna soften it at the end it really isn't you know sarcastic at all so yeah I definitely know what you're saying I'm resisting yeah depending I, on the emoji that you choose i mean you might accidentally make it worse <laughs> that's, the, that's true too the danger that's here. very true and i mean it, there's there's been some hilarious kind of uh screenshots as well when people have confused acronyms because of course before laugh out loud lol was lots of love so yeah. i mean we'll see things like somebody's mother texting like oh your your aunt is dead lol and it's like well <laughs> so maybe not not a time for laughing but i guess guess they didn't get on <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that one i had never heard of the lots of love i'd always heard of laugh out loud and then at some point somebody was like I, I thought it was lots of love and i'm like oh really i never thought that and then i'm like oh my i wonder if anybody ever thought that that's what i meant usually i just do the ha 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 which is probably i almost think like just looking at it it looks kind of more irksome than laugh out loud but i'm like nobody will like mistake that it, ha 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 is obviously you know Ha ha ha! As ridiculous as it looks and sounds. Yeah, I I go for the ha 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 as well. That is my preferred way of communicating laughter. On you know via text. I mean in in person, just laughing is my preferred way. But via the text medium. <laughs> Yeah, Michael hasn't figured out how to do emojis on emails, <clears throat> so I occasionally get the second email, which is basically, now, I, in no way, shape, or form was I trying to be rude when I said that. <laughs> <laughs> I have occasionally. Well, no, normally, though, Bob, it's like I've, I've wrote a reply to you. And then I haven't had coffee. And then I've drank some coffee and I reread it and I'm like, Ah, oh, did I look like an asshole to Bob? Because there's looking like an asshole, and that's bad, but then looking like an asshole to Bob, you know, this gift to the universe that we've all been given. So, yeah, yeah you have to be fast to apologize. I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> the reason why I don't use emojis is I haven't found the asshole one yet. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> well, Lord Mordy says, Gwendolyn, we all know you are an incredibly prolific writer with short fiction, but according to your website, you managed to amass over 60 publications in 2015. Wow. <laughs> Even though there are a few reprints and drabbles on the list, that's an impressive number. What's your secret to so much writing output? I think I got his tone right, even though he didn't include a single emoji. So well yeah. done, Lord Mordy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Like, I don't know. What is I, I don't know. You know, I don't know that there is a, a secret. I, I feel like I also think it's funny that it, that they, they picked out the, the year that I did have a bunch because I've often thought about that year. I'm like, man, I had like 50 or 60 short stories like published that year. And I'll probably never do that again. My goodness. I mean, I don't think I was writing longer work at that point. So it's like, then once you start writing longer work, you get like one as opposed to how many that could be if it was all short stories. So that definitely has an impact on it as well. I do. I do write full time. I always like to say that that definitely that definitely helps. And in, in terms of how much output I have, and I also do not have children. And I always like to point that out as well, because I know that obviously kids, like I was saying earlier, babies are like such like a, a gift, but they're also, I know, very time consuming. So yes. I don't have kids and I do this full time. <laughs> so that that's definitely part of it. But I do try to make sure to set aside time to write, you know, and I just try to keep at it. And if something isn't working, I'm also willing to put it aside and work on something else. I, some writers do well with just pushing through, you know, a story and just keep going. But for me, I, I actually find that I can just slow myself down and make it a very unpleasant kind of experience for myself as a writer. So being willing to kind of put something away, maybe come back to, maybe not. There's certainly been a lot of things that I've just kind of abandoned projects. But every once in a while, I'll go back to one of those a few years later and be like, okay, I think I can do something with that. So you know, I think that, that that helps and just don't be afraid of rejection, I think, as much as, you know, I say that, but nobody likes rejection. That's never going to be a thing any of us actually enjoy. But, you know, don't be afraid of it and don't let it stop you, I think, is the big thing. Just keep going. That that year, I think it was 2015, I had so much rejection that year. There was lots and lots of publications as well. But I remember that was like a thing that, you know, I'd get four or five rejections in a day sometimes. You know, you're sending it out and a lot of them I would even do um simultaneous submissions, you know, where it was, you know, allowed to do simultaneous submissions and everything. And so, you know, you'd sometimes get the same story rejected more than once in one day, which is always like an unpleasant experience. Yeah. At the time. But, you know, <laughs> you just keep going. You, you look at it and say, okay, does it need to be reworked? But sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it just needs to find the right home and, you know, trying to make those, those judgments and not, not, you know, letting the, the, rejection discourage you too much just keep going and I, I do still believe if you keep going you keep working at it and you, you network and you just get your get your work and get yourself out there I, I think that there are I think you can you can have a night you can have a decent career I can I think it can be a lot of fun and, and you can get your get your work out there so that's me being optimistic there's that optimism again <laughs> yeah good yeah that, that's what we need after i've tried to derail and lower the tone multiple times we do need that optimism to to keep coming back but i mean i'm wondering what does a working day look like for you and i mean when you're working on something how long are you sitting down and just writing? I mean, because there seem to be all sorts of different approaches from people who mm -hmm. will just sit on the chair for, for hours and keep writing relentlessly. There mm -hmm. are others who have a more kind of Pomodoro approach that I'll write for 20 minutes, then the alarm will go off, they'll go and do something for five or 10 minutes mm -hmm. and they'll come back. So it kind of keeps each session fresh, although mm -hmm. perhaps difficult if you need a bit of time to get into the the, <laughs> the world. So, I mean, what what about for you? And, and of course, people who just write in, in the morning and then do other mm -hmm. kind of writing tangential work in the mm -hmm. afternoon. Mm -hmm usually and again I, I don't know that I have an average day but what I do tend to do is I'll get up 
you know, have breakfast. I'm a, I'm a big always have breakfast kind of person. I always have been. I get really like cranky if I don't have coffee and food pretty pretty quickly. Yeah. Well, and what's so, your typical breakfast? I usually just it's actually like very standard. It's it's eggs like bacon and uh, coffee with toast, which is what I will say it's been really nice during. Uh, the pandemic is that I, I love bread. I'm like obsessed with bread and always have been. And like, obviously bread does not last all that long. And so we didn't know what we were going to do. Cause it's like, we didn't want to have to go out all the time to, to just to get bread. So my husband's actually learned how to make bread. So I get like homemade bread, like every day, like, and he's like really, really good at it. Like we had tried to make bread years ago and our bread was terrible. Like, but he like has really like taken the time throughout the pandemic to like, like master the, the art of bread making. So that's my every, every day I get like fresh homemade bread. So that's that's very, very exciting. That's a very new thing. And it's been a very exciting thing. So that's uh, that's my breakfast every day. And then I usually do things that are like more about I always say the business side of writing. I get that done first. So trying to respond to emails, getting any contract stuff done, you know, I'm trying to get interview questions written or answered if someone's interviewing me, you know, getting a submission roundup done. That's going to be next week for the submission roundup. I was just looking at it, like writing it down today, getting an interview prep, talking to people online, just doing all of that kind of stuff is usually in the morning. And then my husband works evenings. And so I've always been more in the habit of writing in the evening. So I don't usually sit still for very long, maybe half an hour to an hour at most. Then I'll usually walk around, do something. And a lot of times I'm brainstorming the whole time. And I can a lot of times come up with the best ideas when I'm not sitting at at the screen. I usually like will come up with something when I've like walked away for a minute. So that's kind of like what it is. Like I'll write a little bit, then I'll pace around or I'll make dinner or do something and then come back to it. And yeah, so it's kind of like an off and on all evening usually. I say that, but lots of times, like, there's way more downtime of me just watching, like, YouTube videos or something, so I don't want to make it sound like, yes, I am super disciplined, because that's very much overstating it, so. Yeah, well, I don't think we've ever asked anyone this in 400 or so episodes, but do you have any YouTube channels that you're particularly fond of? Are there any favorite <laughs> YouTubers, and you're like, yeah, this is, this is the one that hits the spot? <laughs> I'm not sure that there is one, but like, I'll be honest, I, just, I love watching like uh, makeup tutorials, especially like there are makeup like artists on YouTube who can like do these incredible transformations. And I just, I love watching them. It's like, again, it's almost like meditative to watch people like put on makeup and like have this like, I was just watching one last week of this girl like doing a transformation into Lily Munster. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to try this. Like I would never have been like, yes, I'm going to cosplay as Lily Munster. Like maybe like uh, Morticia, but I wouldn't have thought of Lily Munster. So this was like so exciting to me. This like, this like pinup model who also does makeup like transforms herself into Lily Monster and I'm like yes yes this is exactly what I need tonight <laughs> to watch this. So did you try it out after? Not yet not yet I've ordered the makeup that she was using it's on its way so I will be trying it at some point. Okay yeah, well like, yeah. you, you yeah, keep I mean, us posted. And <laughs> well if I will. If it goes really well, then maybe that's the maybe that's the cover photo for this episode. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we've got a couple of questions from John W. M. Thompson. First of which, what work of fiction? was your earliest work in dialogue with has that changed who or what are you writing in dialogue with now oh that's a really interesting question actually i'm trying to think like who would i have been writing in dialogue with then that w would have changed i mean shirley jackson is a huge one that i'm always thinking about and, and always inspired by so that that's definitely been there i think throughout my work you know i always come back to edgar Allan poe my dad's a huge poe fan i grew up on poe and i don't know that it's my work's necessarily in direct dialogue with poe but there's definitely inspiration from poe there 
I always think Ray Bradbury, Angela Carter. I'm trying to think if there's anybody who's really changed over the last few years. Not that I can think of, but I, I, I love that question so much. I'm, I'm trying to think like, you know, how have my influences changed over, over the course of, of being a writer and being a published writer? It's a good question. I, I would say that those ones have pretty much stayed pretty much the same throughout, but yeah, but that, I'll be thinking about that question after, after this. And then I'll be like, Oh, I should have said that. Yeah. I know that's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. That, that's often the way. Well, I mean, I wonder kind of tangential to that question, who are some of the writers that you've read recently, let's say in the last few years that have really mm -hmm. wowed you? Let me think. I, you know, I already mentioned her and we are friends, but that, that's not the reason I mentioned her. But I, I love Krista Carmen's work. Her collection, Something Borrowed, Something Blood Soaked came out from unnerving, I think in 2018. And it's it's a great, great collection of short fiction. So I, I love her work. Sarah Tantlinger, who you guys just had on the show, I believe her episode just aired very recently at this, at this point. And uh, that's right. she's great. I, her her writing is, is fantastic. Eden Royce, I, I love Eden's work. I, I mentioned her book, her debut book had been announced when I was on the show last and it just came out a few months ago. So uh, Root Magic. Yeah. And she had written a she had written a lot of short fiction before that, but that was her debut novel and it's it's just a beautiful, beautiful work. Just a beautiful accomplishment. She's it is. an incredible yeah. writer. So <laughs> interestingly enough, we spoke with her a few weeks ago. So mm -hmm. that one is coming oh, up right. too. So we we just ticked uh, two out of the three in terms of this is horror <laughs> podcast <laughs> conversation. So, oh, Krista Carmen, we're good. coming for you. <laughs> <laughs> in, in, insert emoji so that doesn't sound threatening. Like, fucking hell. Michael David Wilson just threatened Krista Carmen on, on air. This is, this is taking an interesting turn. <laughs> 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 derailed myself now with that stupid comment so i think <laughs> i think the only thing we can do is turn to john wm thompson to get us back on track and he says <laughs> what is the one thing that every young goth should know <laughs> that's a great ah oh, oh. What's the one thing every every girl should know? Wow, I don't. I'm not sure. Like, I don't know. I, I I sometimes feel like I'm the worst person to offer advice because I'm always like, do things your own way, find your own way. Maybe that's maybe that's the uh, the <laughs> advice. Be whatever kind of goth you want to be. That I like that. Like, I feel like there was a point in time when like it was like you had to be like one kind of goth, but now it's like, no, there's lots of types of goth. There's there's plenty of, of types of goth. So whatever goth you're, makes your heart happy, be that kind of goth. <laughs> yeah, I'd simply go for always have a spare box of black hair dye because, you know, you, you're going to have to do those roots a lot more frequently than you thought you would, so... <laughs> <laughs> my you know, I, I never tip. dyed my hair, so I never think about that. I've never dyed my hair. I, I just have naturally darker hair, so it's just like I was I was goth enough from the get go. Yeah. I guess it's not black. It's definitely born, not black hair. Born but. goth. That's the name of your forthcoming <laughs> autobiography. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> born goth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, I wonder, I mean, what is a story that isn't classically considered horror that you would put mm. into the genre? Ooh, I know I've got to have something for this because I, I think of so many things as being horror. And I feel like even if even 10, 15 years ago, I'm not sure that people would have been as quick to say that The Lottery by Shirley Jackson or even The Yellow Wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman were, were horror. Whereas now I think that they're pretty much accepted as being part of kind of the horror canon. But I feel like when I first read them, oh, wow, 17 years ago, 17 years ago in undergrad, man, 
yeah, old goth. Uh, <laughs> I don't feel like they were presented to us as being horror, even though they are. But now I, I, I feel like people kind of accept them more as being horror stories. So what else? What is a what is a example of a story that I wouldn't consider horror? The mode that I would consider horror, but that others wouldn't. I was actually on a panel with Sarah Tantlinger not that long ago, and she brought up how Sylvia Plath's work is is very horror, even though we're not normally considering it horror. And I loved that answer. So since I can't think of anything, I will say I will default to Sarah's response of of saying that Sylvia Plath has some very very dark imagery in her work and and was very very macabre in many ways. So I I would say that that's that's a really good one that a lot of people don't don't consider horror, and yet I think very much is horror. I'm trying yeah. to think of something else that like. Because I think of everything as being horror. When people, I mean, it's so weird to me sometimes when people be like, "That's not horror," and I'm like, "That's totally horror." People sometimes still argue that Jaws isn't horror. I'm like, it's it's like literally an a shark <laughs> comes to like eat people. Like this is the epitome of horror. It's like such creature feature. It's a monster movie. Yeah, so it's always weird. I, I've even seen people say The Exorcist is a thriller. I'm like, it's about possession. No, it's a horror movie. It's like as firmly rooted in horror as possible. Mm-hmm. It's always strange to me, and, that, and maybe that's another thing is that I think of so many things as being horror that I won't even consider that maybe other people are like that's not horror. I'm like, oh, it's horror, and I just kind of take it for granted. Like, oh, that's horror. I want all of it. I want everything that I could possibly imagine being horror. It can all come. Like, we can all hang out. It's like a little horror picnic. <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering, and I mean, perhaps we're not the best placed people to answer this, but do you think that? the mainstream definition of horror is expanding and is growing wider and people are accepting that horror is multifaceted or do you think we perhaps have the illusion that that's the case because we are embedded within the horror community and so of course we talk about you know horror tangential things so much I I like to believe that we're getting a wider definition of horror overall. But yeah, your your point is well taken that because, you know, we live in the horror genre, so many of us just sort of are like, oh yeah, of course, of course that's horror. But I I think so. I I do think that we've expanded upon it at, at least a little bit over the last probably even like just 5 years or so because I think of of The Witch and Get yeah. Out and neither one of those are slashers, neither one of those are super gore-laden or anything and yet I, I do feel like they were both, ex, you know, accepted by kind of the mainstream as being horror. So I do think that it's expanding somewhat. I do think that. I'm going to be very optimistic and say that. <laughs> yeah. And I, I'd throw mm-hmm. Midsummer into that category. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, e- yeah. even, even to a point hereditary, I know that... You know, to us, it's like uh, that is very over horror. But to to some people and reading the more mainstream reviews and reactions, I mean, people were surprised that for the first hour or so, there isn't much that's kind of explicitly horror. It's all character Mm -hmm. building. And so Mm -hmm. I think the fact that, you know, people are even accepting that and categorizing it as horror is very encouraging. Yeah, yeah, I would definitely, I would definitely agree with that. I think it's kind of strange, and and maybe this is just the nature of of genre overall, is how our definitions do kind of ebb and flow. And I feel like you know, even in the '60s, a lot of the maybe quieter horror would have still been considered horror. I'm thinking of like The Haunting, you know, when Shirley Jackson's book was adapted, the, the black and white version. And I feel like that was definitely would have been considered horror at that time. But then maybe if it would have been made 30 years later, you know, at you know when the slashers were so much, you know, everywhere kind of omnipresent, that maybe it wouldn't have been considered anymore. Because I think there was a period of time where people would only consider something horror if there was like a lot of blood and guts, and that really didn't come about. I feel like until like maybe the 70s and 80s. So. You know, I think we're getting back to this broader definition, which, by the way, I love slasher movies. I I always, you know, if I say anything like that, it's never saying I don't like them. They're obviously horror. I love them. It's just always like there's more to the genre than just that. Those are great, but there's just more to it than that. And I think for a period of time, people only wanted to kind of see that as being what horror was. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think that that if there's critics that are out there, especially, <clears throat> and I, I use this term lightly when I say critics, but if there's people out there who typically don't like horror who have to add words in front of horror to say that they like something, then yes, mm-hmm. definitely horror is is getting a wider audience. I guess mm-hmm. probably another question is, is that horror actually kind of survives when it's kind of underground, mm-hmm. kind of mm-hmm. secret. So do you think that like possibly an oversaturation of the genre <laughs> will kill it again because these things go in cycles? Uh huh. That's actually a fear I I have. I actually have very much have that fear, and and mm-hmm. I, I don't believe that it will happen. I'm just again, this is this is like the theme of this opt optimism. I'm gonna be optimistic, but it is a fear I have. I'm. I don't understand why it happens with horror. I don't feel like it happens with other genres. I don't think that like sci-fi or fantasy or romance have these times where we're like, no, no romance. Like, I don't feel like that happens with other genres, but for some reason Mm -hmm. it feels like you said that sometimes horror just becomes so subversive again and kind of goes underground. And then, you know, we lost our section in the bookstore for a number of years. I feel like it's starting to come mm-hmm. back to some extent now, but we literally lost our section in a bookstore. And I I find that so strange and, and so disheartening. And so I, I am hopeful that that won't happen again. But considering it has happened before, it is very disconcerting and it is something... I do think about it like it goes through through my mind at least once a week, if not more than once a week of like, are we going to hit an oversaturation point? And I, of course, don't think that can possibly exist because I love horror and have loved horror always. I can't get oversaturated with it. But, you know, I, it does concern me that it could it could hit this point that, yeah, that it's just like, no, nope, this isn't marketable anymore. I hope that doesn't happen. I, I definitely hope that doesn't happen. But. It'll come back if it does happen. It's just going to be very painful and unpleasant for a lot of us if, if it does in the meantime. Yeah. But, I mean, yeah. we're getting at the point now that we're, we're actually getting publishers who are wanting to call, yeah. you know, big yeah. big publishers who want to, to use the horror word. Yeah. You know, and it's yeah. like my fear is I'm like you. It's like, shoot, in five years, it's going to be, well, it's a horror novel. What, what you mean supernatural thriller? Yeah. <laughs> and you'll be like, yeah. oh, fuck stick. That's exactly what I mean. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Let's not call it what it is. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I was like, oh, yeah. Like Bob's kind of rough with the words, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to be optimistic and say this time horror is here to stay. Even if I'm wrong, I'd rather be optimistic about it. Because even if I'm wrong, it's not like I can do anything to prepare for it now, right? Like, there's nothing we can do that's going to be like, like a, a thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, I think because there's so many facets of horror, as we've said, Mm -hmm. even Mm -hmm. if a certain subgenre or a certain mode Mm -hmm. reach saturation point, I don't think at this stage horror will reach saturation point. It would just mean that there'll be something that is more in vogue at a different time. So, I mean, that's a good thing. We've got so many flavors to choose from and i think as as bob often mentions having specific streaming sites like shudder Mm, you know mm -hmm. that means that horror is is 24 hours here to stay because even Mm -hmm. if it fell out of favor with some of the bigger companies it's going Mm -hmm. to be here in some form you've got these specific niches and even though Shudder is a mm-hmm. niche, it's a pretty mm-hmm. bloody big niche. This is not a yeah. small company at mm-hmm. all. And I mean, if you take Netflix, they are doing some interesting things and they are doing mm-hmm. things that not only a horror, but you've got dark thriller, very much horror tangential. There's been enormous mm-hmm. success with the haunting series. Um, the Haunting mm-hmm. of Hill House and Bly Manor. Yeah, yeah. And then, mm-hmm. you know, Sarah Pinbra's Behind Her Eyes was recently mm-hmm. released. Uh, a few years mm-hmm. ago, the likes of The Ritual, Bird Box, Annihilation. Mm-hmm. So I, I think mm-hmm. horror isn't going anywhere. So I, I'd stand behind you or maybe I'd stand next to you. That seems braver <laughs> and say, you know, <laughs> horror is here to stay. <laughs> mm hmm. I yeah, like I mean, it's like a couple of years ago, I predicted that ghosts and witches were going to be really popular, and I was right. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And now I read an article. Um, they because they have a new vampire movie that's coming on uh, Shutter, and they're basically like there's a lot of vampire stuff, and so mm. we're gonna get we're gonna get fangs again, which is cool. Yeah. And it's like you have a vampire book. Yeah. Coming out, you know, yeah. I'm working. I'm working on one. I think Max oh, yeah. Luke is writing one. So I mean, you know, we there's it's it's like we're kind of we're watching this ebb and flow, and it's like, but some of these things never go away. That's mm-hmm. what the article said. It's like vampires never really went away. It's just no. they just weren't no. scary for a while, and <laughs> so now we're getting back into the scary vampire, and that's you know, so I mean, these things they they they. They come and go, you know. Mm-hmm. I, I will say probably after vampires, then zombies will be king again, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's just, and then it's it's you know it's it's this ebb and flow, and we have more writers that are blending genres mm-hmm. that are that are taking steps to to get noticed, to become original, to get a story out there. And there's publishers that are like you know they're looking at that stuff, and that's. To me, that's that's extremely encouraging. Yes, yeah. very much so. Very I hope much so. I hope a few other modes of horror get to have a fair crack before zombies come round again. I mean, I think like zombies are, are still here in a mid-tier way, but they they mm-hmm. must have dominated mm-hmm. the landscape for mm-hmm. <laughs> over a decade. So I I think I think we can wait a bit until they come full circle again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, Giallo needs to make a big comeback before something. Oh. Was Giallo ever mainstream, though? I mean, that, that might we be a first. So. <laughs> yeah, I would actually love it from more of like female perspectives or more, you know, LGBTQ perspectives or more people of color giving their perspectives on it. Because I feel like it was always so kind of white male, you know, that perspective. And I think we could do a lot with, with Giallo. You know, from from like more underrepresented groups, I think that could be really great. Now, 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 I want to write something that's Jallo. Now, this which this what this <laughs> conversation is done. Let's let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm all for it. I, and exactly in exactly the perspectives that you're talking about too. I think that would be yeah. extremely good and interesting to see. Yeah, it really would. Because I'm thinking, we just my husband and I just rewatched Suspiria. I watch it every few years. I'm probably like every eight to ten years, I watch Suspiria, and I always have the same reaction. Like it's so beautifully shot, and there's so many things I like about it. But I'm always like, oh man, there's just a lot of violence against women. A lot of really, really, ex- it's always more extreme than I remember. I, I think when I was young, I was actually a little more jaded to the violence, and now that I'm older, I'm like, wow, it's really, really, really violent. <laughs> So I'm always like, yeah, like maybe more of a female perspective on this. I always think that not that that can't be violent. Obviously, it can absolutely be violent. I'm not taking that away from the female writers, but I think it still brings you know kind of a different perspective on things. So that would be that would be really cool to see. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What did you think to the remake of Suspiria? You know, I haven't been able to get through it. We started watching it, and I could only get through a few minutes, and I'm like, I'm not in the mindset for this. And I, what I loved so much about the original Suspiria was all that cinematography, was the set design, mm. like the production design. And the new one is, and I know it's deliberate. I know it's deliberately a much more drab color palette, but to me, Suspiria is so vivid. It's so vibrant. It's that technicolor. And I was like, I don't know. But I, I think I'd like to go back and try it. Like, I was just saying that to my husband, like, last week. I'm like... Maybe we'll try that new Suspiria again. So. Yeah, the the way I approached it was rather than seeing it as a remake was mm-hmm. a kind of cover song or a reimagining. So in, in the same okay. way that, like that the Haunting of Hill House, the series, mm-hmm. is kind of riffing mm-hmm. on some of yeah. the themes of Shirley Jackson's original mm-hmm. source material. So mm-hmm. if if you go into the remake in inverted commas of Suspiria, you know, expecting it to be a direct remake or wanting it to be loyal in some way, then you're going to be disappointed. Mm -hmm. So really you've got to approach it as a a completely separate film that just Mm -hmm. happens to be riffing on some of those themes. And, and hopefully, you know, you'll get through it and you'll, you'll appreciate it. Will, Will you think, it's as good as the original, you know, probably not, but 
are many films really that is an absolute yeah. classic that is if that yeah. was the bar that you set every time you watch the film you, you, you might stop watching films you're like i'm just <laughs> disappointed things aren't living up to it um especially yeah. the soundtrack as well from goblin yeah. absolutely remarkable yeah. and so ahead of its time as well so mm -hmm. I think we're all going to go away, uh, listeners included, watching a hell of a lot of Giallo after this conversation. <laughs> I love how you mentioned color palette, too, because, I mean, I like both versions of the movie. But in, when, as soon as you mentioned that, the first two words that came to my mind was Vince Gilligan, the guy who did Breaking Bad. Mm. And I'm like, that remake is like Breaking Bad Suspiria. <laughs> because it's got that it's got that it's got that brown it's got mm -hmm. that brown look mm -hmm. and i'm like and it's almost like <clears throat> i started to think david fincher i'm like no david would have a little color you know mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. he would have more yellow um more green but it would be like that you know that that apartment green from 1957 you know so <laughs> <laughs> see it yeah. would be Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, now, I'm sorry to interrupt, but now I'm imagining just uh, th this insane Netflix miniseries that is pitched as <laughs> Suspiria, but make it Breaking Bad. And just what would that even look like? That would be absolutely insane because you'd want to incorporate all the classic elements of giallo but you'd somehow have to make it this kind of fast-paced uh, action thriller and i i don't know what that would look like but i want someone to make it <laughs> <laughs> that would be it would probably be amazing yeah <laughs> And a lot of people would hate it. Yeah. <laughs> Which means it's probably pretty good. <laughs> yeah. So someone make it happen. Josh Malaman, yeah. write that script. You're fucking crazy enough to do that. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to take a moment of silence for Josh Malaman to enter the call and confirm that he will be doing that. <laughs> Bob, you were talking. I derailed you. No, it's just, I mean, and, and your, your derailment actually worked because, yeah. I mean, <laughs> that, that it, it's just every director has like their own like flavor that they're going to, mm -hmm. they're going to put in there. And mm -hmm. it's so much to do with color, mm -hmm. you know, and then, and then, to go back and think about, you know, because that was my first thought when I heard they were remaking Suspiria. I was like, mm -hmm. are they going to keep it with the same color? Mm -hmm. You know, and, I, and when I watched it, I didn't even think about it. I just knew it was darker. But as soon as you said palette, I was like, oh, mm -hmm. wait a second. Because, you know, they 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 actually go in and, and tone these things down mm -hmm. and turn up things. And, you know, and it's just... uh I can only imagine how, how, how fun that is. But at the same time, I can also imagine someone like David Fincher, who's like a perfectionist. It's just like, maybe he can't get the color right. He's like, screw it. I'm not going to put it out. <laughs> <laughs> so you have like, you got to, well, how, how many hours did he shoot? He shot 23 hours and we're not putting it out. What the fuck? Really? <laughs> <laughs> I love, we've even designed a backstory for this at this point. Which yeah. is great. <laughs> Fincher cut. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, we can interview David Fincher without even getting him on. I'll ask the questions and Bob will provide the answers. <laughs> what do you think you should be kinder to yourself about? Oh, probably a whole lot of things. But I like this. What should I be kinder to myself about? I don't know. Probably, like, I probably work too much. I probably... Even the times when I do take time off, I'm like, shouldn't have taken time off. Should have been working. So maybe a little bit kinder to say, hey, like, take a little bit of, of time to unwind. I think that that's probably more important than I uh, give it credit for. So we'll go with that. <laughs> mm. And when you do try to have 
kind of pure Gwendolyn unwind time. What does that look like? What are things that you do to relax? Relax? What is that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's you know, I, probably I, I, an answer I would have given, but <laughs> not the answer I wanted. I, I'm trying to take notes. <laughs> you know, I, I try to... I always, always say, like, you know, we, we live on this abandoned horse farm, so we do have 30 yes. acres. So now it's, it's spring here, and I, <laughs> I love I love spring on, on, on the old abandoned horse farm. It's it's just, it's such a pretty season anyways, and it, it feels all, again, optimism. It feels so hopeful. And so, like, I'm really trying to take a lot of walks. The problem is right now, like, I don't know why there's so many, but there are so many ticks this year, so many more than there are. So it's like, even like the hopeful thing, I'm like, oh no, we're going to end up with Lyme disease because there's just ticks (laughs) everywhere. We pulled one off our poor little cat this week. I felt so bad. They have never had a tick on them in in their lives. And like that she had a tick on her. I felt so bad. I'm like, oh gosh, she doesn't even go outside. That means we brought it into her. But Normally, when I try to relax, I try to walk outside. I don't know why there's so many like creepy crawlies trying to attack my family, but see, that's a horror story unto itself. Yeah, <laughs> creepy yeah. insects. But you know, and watching horror, I actually love horror. Horror is also a way to just unwind. And so we we actually just got Shutter. We didn't have Shutter until very recently, and so we just got that, and we're going through. I love love horror documentaries. I'm like a really big fan of documentaries in general. So I love horror documentaries. So I've been watching the the horror documentaries on there. Uh, we just finished uh, Crystal Lake Memories, so the one about Friday the Thirteenth. Mm. So that was really really fun. I'd wanted to see it. We had watched the Never Sleep Again. Nightmare on Elm Street won a documentary last year. I think we just rented that off of Prime. So that's like a, just, I love like hearing the behind the scenes on, on things. I just always have found that so fascinating. So that's, that was really fun. Mm, yeah. And since you've uh, mentioned the abandoned horse farm again, and that was <laughs> one of my favorite things we spoke about a couple of years ago, have, have there been any, Weird happenings recently, anything supernatural or disquieting, um, all about the abandoned horse farm anecdotes. So if we've got a This Is Horror exclusive, that would be great. <laughs> this is horror exclusive, I love it. Anything weird happened in the last year or two on the, on the old abandoned horse farm, I'm trying to think. I'm not sure anything that I would even say could be supernatural, but one of my favorite things that happens is like, we'll be watching something and like, there'll be like a creaking from somewhere in the house. And I'll be like, Oh my gosh, like we're watching horror and there's creaking in the house, but it'll just be like one of the cats opening a door, but they'll like do it at exactly the right moment to like, like make it as creepy as possible. I'm trying to think if we've said anything weird has happened. I feel like something weird has probably happened, but like, like, around the abandoned horse farm it's just like oh weird thing happened okay we're just gonna go about our day so it's like i feel like i never end up having good anecdotes even though i probably should because like there's always something odd happening the cat's watching things that aren't there our younger cat like always she'll just watch things like the the older cat doesn't usually do that as much but the younger cat like i'm always like i think she sees ghosts she sees them like she can follow things around and i'm like i have no idea what she's looking at you yeah. growl at things sometimes and i'm like oh boy that's kind of freaky yeah <laughs> i can't see what's happening but yeah i mean <laughs> you, you said that you don't have children and don't have a desire to have children but in a yeah. way having a pet is a little bit similar because like children will suddenly just start staring at things or following something <laughs> around that isn't there so i mean you, you've already got half the experience of <laughs> being a parent just with that, that experience with your cat <laughs> <laughs> they are they're like little furry children they are my yeah. mom used to always make the joke that like dogs are like kids you just can't take anywhere although you can now i feel like the world is like more equipped for pets but like years ago like you, there were no like dog cafes or anything so it was like you have a dog but like it's like your child that no one lets you take anywhere <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> So um, when the doors have creaked open and things, you've never turned around and there's just a horse's head looking in, nothing like that. 
happened for you? <laughs> no, no. Although we did find like a skull like far back on our property recently. I've been meaning to take out like some flowers and like decorate the skull and take a picture of it and put it up on social media. <laughs> like there's just like, we find weird things. We found like, you know, because coyotes get things or bobcats. We definitely have bobcats. Then sometimes you'll just find a piece of something and you'll have like a piece of an animal. And it's like, oh, this is disturbing. But here we are, life on the farm. Okay, now this is the material that we're looking for. So, I yeah. mean, do you, mm-hmm. did, did you identify <laughs> what creature skull this is from? And if you have various pieces of animals that... um turn up have you considered collecting them and creating your own frankenstein's animal (laughs) no to the last question no i should say yes i should i should be like yes we're going to create a little frankenstein i mean it's never too late gwendolyn if you (laughs) you want to start from today (laughs) (laughs) and the skull is just i think just a deer skull so it's it's fairly fairly normal all all together so but yeah, I think it's a, a deer skull. It's kind of small though. So I don't know. It could be something else. Yeah. But yeah, like I know like one time we just, this is so disturbing. I always feel bad because like if animal lovers are listening to this, it's disturbing. Like we went out one time and I don't think I was with my husband for this, but he just like found a woodchuck leg. It was just a woodchuck leg like in the backyard. And it's like, oh man, poor woodchuck. That's sad. Uh, yeah. Or other times when we'll find like a bunch of like fur or a bunch of like feathers. I think my husband always tries to make me feel better. And it's like, well, it is like the time that they might be shedding. And I'm like, mm-hmm, yeah, <laughs> I mean, that could be true. <laughs> or it could be something got eaten right here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I suppose it depends what you find when you follow the trail of feathers, you know, what's at the end. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Nature is mean. I always say that. Like, it's it's not like, it's not kind. It doesn't care. It doesn't have like, you know, you should be kind. It's like nature does what nature does. But, uh, creepy, creepy yeah. sometimes. <laughs> yes, it does. But, I mean, I guess, I mean, what one good thing living out in nature is obviously... You know, w- with this current situation, the pandemic, it it does mm-hmm. presumably mean that when you want to get out and you want to have you know decent walks, you've got all this land and and mm-hmm. surroundings where you can do that. So it's not like if you're living in an urban environment and then oh. you know you you really are quite stuck in terms of what you can do for that. Yeah, yeah, we've definitely been grateful for the fact that we can just like walk around out back. And like, you know, just stretch our legs and everything. And I always joke and I'm like, if we see anybody in our backyard, we can ask them to leave. <laughs> it's not like in a city, if you're walking around, you can't tell like some poor random person, like you need to get out of, you need to get off the sidewalk. But in our like areas where we walk, it's like nobody should be here. We can just be left alone. <laughs> yeah. Social distance world, should social distance. Yeah. I mean, you you could try asking people to leave the city. (laughs) It's like, excuse me, this is uh, my portion of the sidewalk. I don't know if you if you do it enough times and get enough of a reputation, people might just give you a wide berth. So it all works out okay in the end. I mean, the the consequence or the the negative is if you do get arrested and it's like Miss Keist, you aren't allowed to do that this isn't actually (laughs) your sidewalk but you got to take a risk and you know you got to have that optimistic mindset that we were talking about before (laughs) i just can't i can't (laughs) that's hilarious i'm positively sure that you're going to want to leave the city after we have this conversation <laughs> yeah it, it so does great. sound like the start of some apocalyptic film it's like leave the city get <laughs> out you need to leave the city <laughs> no, you, you, but you're still saying it like with a negative tone you have to be leave the city leave it yes <laughs> just leave it behind leave it all behind leave leave the city <laughs> <laughs> you gotta say with a smile. <laughs> People will be like, "Hey, we gotta go. We have to leave." <laughs> it's a good thing. <laughs> just leave our shit here. We're just leave. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I will say though, lots of people can actually get things like they can get like 
food delivered to their house whereas we're so rural like no one will deliver us a pizza like we can't get like DoorDash or anything out here so when people like talk about getting food like delivered to their house I'm like lucky so yeah like wow like I guess this was always the way that it was like there's a place that they'll like meet you like halfway we're not even that far out of the nearest town we're only like six miles out of the nearest town it makes it sound like we're like 30 we're not but like they won't come this far out like they'll meet us at like a barn there's like a barn where they'll meet you <laughs> if to pick up your pizza it's like we we go as far as the white barn and everybody knows what the white barn is and it's like I'm not like I'm just gonna drive the rest of the way it's like three more miles I'm gonna get in my car I'm just gonna drive and get my pizza like oh, wow. that just seems weird but yeah it sounds, so it sounds like harker <laughs> trying to get it to dracula's castle <laughs> this is as far as we go <laughs> no, 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 man. you see that up there way up there that's where i gotta go <laughs> yeah you're like, oh. <laughs> you know. oh my gosh i love that parallel i never would have thought of that but that's such a great a great comparison it's we're like, only no, taking my pizza house. so far <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's one interpretation. The other is that we're using pizza as a kind of code word. It's like, I don't think that's pizza you're getting delivered. It's like, meet at the white barn for the pizza. That's what, yeah. that's what we're buying in its illicit location. <laughs> Pizza. It's so weird. It's so weird to be like, we're going to meet you at a place with your pizza. It does. It sounds illicit in some way. Like you're doing something you should have like, no, I'll just come the rest of the way into town in a well-lit area and pick up my pizza. <laughs> uh, and then they, they, when you leave, they all they're bringing it back to that house. <laughs> <laughs> that house. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Well, what is something new that you've done or tried recently? Well, we were actually talking about this before we started, so I'll talk about it now. Like, my husband and I have been taking online cooking classes. Like, they've been through this uh, this place. Like, it's like kind of like a garden place. I'm not selling it very well, but it's called Phipps. It's in Pittsburgh, and they've been doing online classes. They used to do classes at the location. It's like a botanical garden. That's the word for it. I am a writer, and I can obviously always think of words when I need them. It's a botanical garden, and uh, and so they were doing uh, online cooking classes, so my husband and I have been doing that. We learned how to make omelets last night, so that was a very exciting thing, and the way they taught us, it's actually very violent. It's, it's this Julia Child's method of <laughs> making omelets, and you like tilt the pan 20 degrees and then you like yank the pan really really hard once like a second until eventually it'll just like flip back on itself it's kind of like magic but it's very very aggressive and it's kind of loud because you're like literally dragging a pan across your yeah it, it across your stove it was pretty weird but we made omelets so i feel like that's that's an accomplishment like i couldn't i actually like two years two or three years ago i couldn't cook anything like i was not good at cooking any kind of food like i was like a tv dinner kind of person and i'm like i don't know i should probably learn how to make something so i took a few cooking classes before the pandemic and then i'm like you know once the pandemic hit and we're obviously at home i'm like hey let's try to make a cooking class at home so that's that's something that's something new and at least it's like you know i have to eat regardless yeah <laughs> so <that's> something <laughs> yeah i mean i've always had like kind of basic cooking skills or maybe a little bit above basic and recently though I have decided to up my game a little bit more and but perhaps as part of it that is to do with um, having recently separated and now being in like a new relationship it's like well i've got to impress in on in every area so i'm gonna take my cooking to the next level so i mean i i made this uh like italian chicken and a tomato sauce the other day and i got some Ooh. vine tomatoes to form the base rather than just using like a tin added some fresh cream and some fresh basil and it it worked pretty well i i was I was impressed with my own cooking. I came away and I thought, yeah, you done good. <laughs> you have done good. And e even with the mashed potatoes, it was like, well, we're putting fresh garlic in, we're putting some fresh rosemary and 
parsley and we're taking things to the next level so I'm, I'm trying to apply much like with my writing and podcasting game now to my dating game it's like be so good they can't ignore you or maybe the the modern equivalent is be so good they can't ghost you I don't know but so far <laughs> it's working out okay oh that's great that's awesome I love that yay yeah, and this is uh, not going to convince you that we aren't, in fact, rebranding to This Is Cooking. <laughs> Bob's like, I'm, I'm going to have to to bow out of this one. Although then again, like, I mean, you, you cook a pretty good Cajun from what, what I understand, like Cajun culinary. This isn't cannibalism or anything like that. <laughs> cook a pretty good Cajun. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, it, it's, I don't know. It, cooking is, is uh, you got to have time for it. Yeah, that's See, true. And that's, like, that's like a big, big, big thing for me. It's like mm -hmm. having the time. So it's like, <laughs> I have these great ideas, like what you're talking about. Hey, I'm going to cook a spaghetti. Mm -hmm. You know, and I start looking at recipes, and I call my <laughs> mom and things like that. And then I'm at the store, and I'm like, they have all this stuff in a jar. Yay, <laughs> 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 man. You know, so it's like, I'm going to get three jars. <laughs> and it gets me just like, I don't have time. I'm not, I don't mm -hmm. have time to dice all that stuff up. And, you know, mm -hmm. but some of the things that I like is that I'll, you know, like to cook stuff in a crock pot because I can do all mm -hmm. that in the morning. Mm -hmm. And 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 by by the time I'm hungry in the afternoon, it'd be like, man, what is that awesome smell? Oh, that's <laughs> Pot, where I had raw ingredients that are now cooked and that's I love that that's just mm -hmm. cause you ain't got to do shit you can go right you can go run some errands da 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 da, da. Mm -hmm. you don't have to mm -hmm. you know having to do anything you just got to get up early if you want to eat it that day <laughs> you know and I get up early <laughs> so yeah yeah, yeah. where did that come from <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do, I do think the crock pot and the instant pot are certainly good tools to yeah. have. But yeah. um, better change the subject or, <laughs> or it's going to be official that this is now, well, 400 episodes on horror <laughs> to come to an end at some point. But the, the thing is, because of the because of the popularity of cooking shows, I bet mm -hmm. if we if we made this like horror writers cooking stuff, it'd probably be more popular than this is horror. You get like the crossover <laughs> of horror and and the cooking demographic. So potentially <laughs> post pandemic, we've got our own video cooking spin off. So <laughs> could be what's happening. What do you say, Bob? Yep. Well, I mean, <laughs> if we, could, we could tie in some some cheeseburgers in there somewhere. Ooh. I mean, I'm getting hungry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> My cheeseburger game is pretty tight. Yeah, I've I've been working on cheeseburgers recently too. So bring it yeah, on. Yeah, they've been working on me. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Like, wow, where'd that come from? Yeah, it's like I lose, I lost ten pounds. I, I had to, I had like a stress diet. You know, this is this is how you lose weight like really fast. It's like have something yeah. that's very stressful happen, and then the next thing you know is like your genes are loose, and you're just like, and, and, and it's like you're eating like you're eating like you know a warthog. You know, it's like. I was like donuts. I need them too, you know. And you're still losing weight, but then when the stress goes away, all that weight comes back, mm. and you're still eating, you know. So that's it's not good. Yeah, that is. I don't know not... about this cooking thing, man. I'm a diabetic. We're gonna have to go back to horror. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the stress diet is not a diet that I endorse. That is not no, the way to no. do it, Bob. No. And I hope that you're feeling you know, in a better place now. Yeah, I am. I don't recommend the stress diet. It's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not good. It's not a good thing. Yeah. I know what you mean, though, because, um, I mean, when, when I first separated, I lost, I lost my appetite and it didn't come mm -hmm. back until, like, 
until I'd even uh, become okay with what was going on mentally. So like physically, that took longer for my body to adapt than me being mentally okay with the situation. And so everything just kind of tasted bland and gray. And I had, Mm -hmm. it, it, it was as if I had no taste buds anymore. Um, and I couldn't keep food down so easily. Now I, I ate anyway, but not as much, but I ate because Mm -hmm. it's like, well, I'm a human being. This is what I I'm supposed to do. I would like to continue to, to exist, but there was no joy in it for a while. I mean, obviously Mm -hmm. you can tell now I'm cooking all sorts of things and the, (laughs) the appetite is back, but it's, it's pretty scary when a part of your body just decides like, right, I'm not going to work. <laughs> it isn't going to function yeah. how you're supposed to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, to take, to take, <laughs> to take the conversation <laughs> in a cheerier. In fact, no, that fucking question isn't cheerier. <laughs> <laughs> spill it (laughs) okay if you could change one thing in your life what would it be and why (sighs) i feel like right now it would it would definitely be the pandemic and i i would want to change it so that it would be over and everybody would be would be safe from it so yeah I, i feel like that's like the main thing right now is that just all of us at least most of us staying home a lot i guess not everybody is staying home all all the time some people don't even like wearing masks but we we won't talk about them right now i'm trying to be optimistic but yeah i feel like that's the main thing right now that's the thing that i you know keep keep thinking about and keep talking about the 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 most i feel it's just like wanting to be able to get back into the world and and just more than that it's just knowing how much how hard this is on on so many people and wanting things to just be able to, I don't know that we'll ever be able to go back to normal per se, but something a little bit more normal, at least a little bit safer for people. So that's definitely the main thing that I'd want to change right now. I mean, what, what do you think going back to normal would look like? And if not going back to normal, what do you think the reality will look like? How do you... Uh, see it because I I mean I could see us going back to something better than yeah. what we had before I mean particularly mm-hmm. if you as ridiculous as it is I feel there's now just more awareness for kind of cleanliness and hygiene <laughs> and you know protecting yourself from different diseases and we've seen mm-hmm. be- because of this increased focus on health Mm -hmm. and cleanliness. I mean, there's been lower rates of the flu and other Mm -hmm. illnesses. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, Mm -hmm. if we implement some of the things that we've been Mm -hmm. doing Mm -hmm. during this pandemic, we could Mm -hmm. be living in a better and healthier society. And I mean, the, the mask issue is an interesting one because in Asia and so in Japan where I am, Mm -hmm. Masks mm-hmm. have been around for years. I mean, I first mm-hmm. came mm-hmm. to Japan in 2014, and if somebody had the flu or a cold, then you wore a mask. But also, you didn't just wear it to protect others from you. People would actually wear one during flu season because mm-hmm. they didn't, you know, what want to get that now. I don't think that there should be a mandate that people should now be wearing masks indefinitely and that's the way that it goes. But I think if if you want to wear a mask during flu season, then you know that's your right and that should be something mm-hmm. that you yeah. do. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, I think and I hope as well that we might see um, bosses and employers actually when someone's a little bit sick or they even have a cold say you know what 
take the day for yourself and then people will be able to to recover mm -hmm. more fully rather than forcing mm -hmm. themselves to come in when they're feeling a bit under the weather and then the next yeah. thing you know the whole office has got it yeah and i also think in terms of uh, offices I'm, I'm really hoping that there's still going to be a lot of work from home for the jobs that can do it because that, that's so much more accessible for yeah. so many people for so many different reasons that i know you know pe people with disabilities have talked for years how it's like oh you can't work from home it's just too hard for the company and i said to my husband and other people have pointed this out it literally took everybody about a week to figure out how to do it it yeah. was unbelievable how quickly like it's like we can't possibly do this mm -hmm. i've been like th once everything shut down everybody figured it out it was unbelievable how quick it was that all the companies within a few days managed to figure it out and they had to do it like in the middle of a pandemic with everyone so obviously they could have done it with one or two employees you know mm -hmm. years ago who had asked so that's a good point and that's that's a real positive that i that i'm hoping for is that the, the jobs that can be you know can still work from home that's a lot more accessible for a lot of people and that's a lot easier on a lot of people so Hopefully that's something that, that will stick around. And I, I like your point about, you know, we do know, we, we are now a lot more aware of how much most of us were not washing our hands as often as we probably mm -hmm. should have. And I'm, you know what, I'm going to admit I, I was one of those people. I would wash my hands, but I, you know, I don't know if I did it for the 30 seconds. Now I always do. Now I'm much more like hyper aware of those types of things. And so I, I definitely think that that's good. So I, I like that. I like the idea that we could actually come out of this and maybe the new normal won't won't will actually be a more positive thing that we've actually learned things from all of this. I like that a lot. Well, what are your two top priorities in life right now? Oh, wow. Yeah. This is like a very philosophical conversation. Like, wow. Yeah, did huh. did you expect anything less? <laughs> <laughs> expecting to be asked about the old abandoned horse farm which i was so you know check that off i mean we we can return to it i can i can basically push that topic for the next 10 or so minutes of the remainder of the conversation if that's what you're saying no, i hear you no, i'll take no, you in. i like this i like it i just yeah so <laughs> two two major things out of life right now just to try try not to worry so much i feel like i can i can really spin out a lot of worry out of my out of my mind so i'm like trying to be like okay just one thing over the last year with everything that's happened has made me realize you can't prepare for everything no matter how prepared you want to be there's no way any of us were really prepared for this last year and and what's happened and so trying to remind myself of that that that's that's a big thing and i i always also try to add on it's kind of the same thing maybe a different side of the the same coin of just try to have a little bit more fun with things try to have a little bit more fun with writing sometimes it can be like oh i didn't get as many words written today as i wanted to but it's like you know trying to trying to just enjoy the process more so and just trying to and trying to enjoy like making my violent omelets more you know that's that's a good thing trying to enjoy writing more in my violent omelets that i make <laughs> Well, I mean, what other kind of life goals and priorities could one possibly have? I mean, you, you've got it all. You've got the writing. You've got the omelets. That, that is the writer's <laughs> life. <laughs> that is it, it right it is. there. There you go. <laughs> yeah. See, I, I want to know what other things you've been cooking, but I can't fucking ask that. Or it's like, no, you really are going strong on the, <laughs> on the cooking questions today. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's you know with me personally cooking more it's obviously you know became something I'm particularly interested in right now well actually this is kind of horror related but like um my husband and I we got this uh Tim Burton cookbook so that's kind of horror it's at least horror adjacent so it's like it's themed around different Tim Burton movies from a place called uh a restaurant i think it's in new york and la called beetle house and they uh, all their thing their whole theme is you know tim burton themed restaurant and so they uh they put out this cookbook so my husband and i did a bunch of them we took pictures and just put them on online for like this little dinner party for two with tim burton themed uh food so it was like i think the drink was called the beetles juice and there was the the food was like uh the beetle bread and the sweeney beef 
Beats, and then there was like Beetle Pie. So it was like very much like kind of like horror. Like I consider, I know that a lot of Tim Burton stuff isn't necessarily what a lot of people would say is horror, but I very much consider it like dark fantasy. So I consider it in the horror umbrella. So yeah, so that was fun. So that was that. We've been cooking that, and that's even horror related. So. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to have to check out that recipe book. I love it. <laughs> it. It was, it's fun. It's fun. A lot of them are like, I would not have been able to do a lot of the stuff in the cookbook a couple of years ago. Some of us a little more involved. But I'm like, you know what? I've been taking my skills to the next level because I've got nothing else to do with my time than to cook. So I was able to do more of the recipes than I would have been able to do a couple of years ago. So I was proud. I was like, I've got a little bit of cooking technique now, and it doesn't just involve putting something in the microwave and press, pressing start. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you are leveling up. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, where can our listeners connect with you? Uh, on social media is the main place, on Facebook and on Twitter. Just look me up on my name by my name, Gwendolyn Keist, and on my website, GwendolynKeist.com. At my blog, I do monthly submission roundups with different submission calls that are open that month. And I also do uh, interviews, you know, either weekly or at least a couple times a month. So, yeah, so look for me there. I, I like to think I'm somewhat friendly. So, <laughs> <laughs> All right. And do you have any final thoughts to leave our listeners with? Just, you know, try to just take care of yourselves. I think that, that that's a big thing. I think all of us could do better at taking care of ourselves right now and just taking time for yourself. So take care of yourself. You deserve it. Thank you so much for listening to This Is Horror with Gwendolyn Keist. Join us next time for the big one for episode 400 with the creator of Final Destination, Jeffrey Reddick. But if you want to get that ahead of the crowd, if you want every episode ahead of the crowd, become our patron at patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Lots of perks. Check it out today. Okay, before I wrap up, a little bit of an advert break. Spacefaring researchers disturb an ancient horror. An enchanted object curses a grieving widow. A haunted reel torments a film student. A murder trial hinges on a chilling testimony. Howls from Hell. A new horror anthology from Hal Society Press. Stephen Graham Jones calls it quality horror by true believers who can write. With a foreword by Grady Hendrix, Howls from Hell unveils the horror writers of tomorrow with spine-tingling stories from P.L. McMillan, Shane Hawk, J.W. Donnelly, Lindsay Ragsdale, Amanda Nevada DeMell, and others. Available now in paperback, ebook, and audiobook from Amazon and most other major booksellers. Howls from Hell. From best-selling author Lee Mountford comes a new supernatural horror series perfect for lovers of demonic haunted houses. Book 1, Haunted Perrin Manor, follows two sisters as they move into an old family home only to discover evil already resides there. The series is available in ebook and paperback formats and high-quality audiobooks from producer Hannibal Hills. Search Amazon and Audible for Haunted Perrin Manor now. Don't just read horror, experience it. Every episode, I like to end with a quote. And right now, life has taken a bit of a rough turn for me. Uh, this is the roughest it's been in a long time. It's probably the roughest it's ever been. And I wish I could talk about why it's rough, but I can't. Not now. So with that in mind, a little quote for others who might be Indeed, enduring bad times right now. This is from Matt Haig. Soak up the views, take in the bad weather and the good weather. You are not the storm. I'll see you in the next episode with Jeffrey Reddick. But until then, take care of yourselves, be good to one another, read horror, keep on writing, and have a great great day.
This is Horror Podcast. What what did you have for lunch? Let's do that as a sound test. (laughs) This this isn't like part of the interview now. You're like, wow, this guitar has really fucking changed the direction. (laughs) I'm I'm recording. This is good stuff. (laughs) This is a sound test. This is not to be recorded for the actual episode. (laughs) Pandemic has fucked up MDW. I actually had an omelet. My husband and I took a uh, cooking class online and we uh, learned how to make omelets last night. So like we were trying out our omelet technique today. So that that was our lunch. Yeah. How, how did that go? Were you competing? Was it some sort of like top chef <laughs> challenge where you, you, you and your husband no. went head to head? <laughs> now, now I feel like that was a missed opportunity. No, it was not. A, we were not competing, but now I feel like we should have been. We should have each had like a pan of eggs and like, who makes the better omelet? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> have you got any omelet tips for me and Bob and possibly for the outtake if Bob decides this material is, <laughs> is the gold that people need? <laughs> well, the class was like a Julia, a Julia Child's class. It was like her technique. And like apparently she was like pretty aggressive with her omelets. Like you actually like tilt the pan and then you just like you just like yank it back a bunch of times. Like once every second as like hard as you can to like get the eggs to like settle so it was like really very intense it was a lot more aggressive than i was expecting i was like oh we'll make an omelet this will be pretty straightforward but i was like whoa this is pretty serious stuff but i mean i guess if you're angry when you're trying to make dinner it's a way to like burn off some anger so i guess that's something <laughs> yeah so, like basically she's like like that's how you flip it is you actually physically like shove the pan back and forth yes yes it's like you you tilted it like this up at like a 20 degree angle and then like every second you just pull it back again and again and like yanks across and it kind of makes a terrible noise but then like eventually the omelet will start to fold on itself just like a, a nice omelet looks like it's actually very strange or i would not have expected that to be the way to make a, a french omelet at least according to julia style julia child <laughs> I'm not even going to try that because that just sounds like a mess on my end. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's what my husband kept saying. He's like, this is going to make a mess. And I'm like, let's try it anyways. I'm like, I'll be aggressive with my with my eggs. <laughs> yeah, this is a very different omelet technique to the one that I have. It, it doesn't really involve right. violence or punching the pan or anything <laughs> like that. It, it's a, a simple, gentle meal to make. <laughs> it's a splatter omelet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Spider punk omelet. Here we go. Man. Yeah. I didn't know that, you know, asking you that question would relate to horror, but, you know, this is what horror authors do. They're very fucking angry when they're making their food. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just I knew you had to beat the eggs, like, you know, to get them real fluffy, but I didn't know you could, like, you know, be aggressive. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is. Guess so. <laughs> <laughs> hey, things you learn. Things you learn in in quarantine. Because yeah. like I'm just trying to keep keep us busy in the house because we don't go anywhere or do anything. So I'm like, oh, online cooking class. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> uh, 